Welcome back to 755 Forever. I'm David O'Brien, Braves writer at The Athletic. I'm with my co-host, Eric O'Flaherty, former Braves reliever. What's happening, Eric? What's up, Dave? Not much, man. We had a uh, we had a cold opening trip, as expected, when you're opening in Philly. It said we're recording. I hope we didn't start too early. But anyway, we had a cold opening trip when you start in Philly and Chicago. That's going to happen in March and April. Um, Fortunately, they were able to get five of the six games in. The only one they did not get in was the last one in Chicago. I tell you, when we were in Philly looking at the forecast in Chicago, I was thinking they're going to be lucky to get in five innings of one game and yeah. get out of there. And they got two games in. They The one they had to stop after eight, but the other was a nine-inning game without rain on second game. Uh, and then the third was no way because the snow started, you know, in the morning. And it was snow, wintry mix, and they were like – to be honest, I changed my flight and flew out Thursday morning. I was like, there's no way they're going to play. And and they went out there, went all through the motions and and uh, went to the ballpark and everything and didn't bang it until right before uh, it was it would have started. So I was home by then. <laughs> I, I never understand. I never understand. Maybe, you know, they can open the gates and sell some beverages or something like that and make a little money that day without a game. But I've never understood why it has to drag out like that when it's obvious you're not going to play. And you know you got more you got more of an excuse if you're at a place where you got big crowds, yeah, because they can sell a lot of beer, merchandise, hot dogs, whatever. Yeah, but you're talking about the two crowds for the the paid attendance of the first two games there was thirteen thousand something for the Braves. So the third game with the snow and the and the rain, there's there's not going to be half that many people there. So you don't even have that excuse. Meanwhile, you're going to pay all the stadium employees to come out. Because they have to, you know, if you don't bang it early in the morning to where you don't have to pay them, you got to pay them to come out. I don't know what the what the union rules are there, how much you got to pay them or whatever. But you're putting out, you inconvenience a lot of people when this was mm -hmm. the most obvious rain snow out of all time. I mean, there was no way you were going to play. The forecast was like 90 percent rain and snow through like six o'clock for a one o'clock game. Yeah, I mean, there's got to be some financial benefit to it, because every time that we'd be sitting in the clubhouse for three hours and you're looking outside, like there's no chance, Yeah, you know, and it, you just wonder, I'd rather just fly in on an off day, take an off day away. Let's have the off day today. We'll come back through and finish this at some other point. I never, I've never understood why they try so hard to get those games in, but I'm sure there's, there's a reason for it. And it's MLB making a calls to the, they took it away from the teams years ago. So it's MLB that's doing this. And um, so you, the blame should go on them. And I tell you what, um, for those who keep asking me, because I know people don't see it sometimes if you tweet it or you talk about it and all this, but everybody acts. The Braves have opened on the road like 16 out of 22 times for the last five years, I think. They've opened literally more at Philly, I, I think. I have, I didn't look it up. I meant to. They've, more, they've opened more at Philly since Truist Park opened than they've opened at Truist Park. Really? <laughs> yeah. So – but I've talked about this before. The reason for that, MLB should, of course, schedule the first series at the warm weather places and the dome stadiums and all that. But you can't do that every year because you cannot. You can't tell the Minnesota Twins, for instance. You never get or, an opening day. You never get opening day. But it should be those teams that if if there's going to be a team opening 15 out of 20 years on the road, it should be one of those teams, right? Not the team. That, yeah. So, so I mean, if you're going to do it to a, a Southern team or a warm or a team with a dome, it should be done to those teams that get, you know, but I've taught, I've talked about this before. I don't think the Braves would ever acknowledge this, but the Braves asked for years because the Braves crowds were affected by school being in session more than any other town we went to. I never went to another town where they had smaller crowds compared to their weekend crowds when school was in session than they were in Atlanta. I don't know why that is because a lot of their fans were from the suburbs and the ballpark was downtown at Turner yeah. field, all that kind of thing, I guess. So, but for whatever reason, the crowds were more affected by school being in session in Atlanta than anywhere else we went. So as a result, the Braves, they're no dummies. They asked MLB, and the Braves have a lot of have a lot of pull because they are one of the gold standard franchises. They said we would prefer to open on the road, and that's a marquee team opening on the road. So, so whatever city they're in, that's a that's a big matchup. Most places sell out the opening night anyway, but that assures you're going to get big crowds for the whole opening series. 
But they said we rather would open on the road in exchange for getting more summer games and especially yeah. the summer holiday games. Yeah. And that's why the Braves have had more, most of the time are playing at home on the 4th of July and oh, Memorial man. Day and just more games in general when school is not in session. That's interesting because I'm trying to think about it. And I remember, you know, starting on the road a lot, but I remember a lot of 4th of July's yep. at home. I remember you, almost every time they bring the troops out, you're in Atlanta. Yeah. Uh, uh, certain holidays, it's like they always happen in Atlanta. That's interesting. I never knew that. And and an, a reason a reason why I think that they, if they haven't already, should tell MLB, okay, that is what we said all those years, but forget it now. Just treat us like any other team. We would rather open at home as much as anybody does. Is because, at least for now, when they're this good, that's no longer the rule. The Braves sell out. It doesn't matter when the games yeah. are. Yeah, that's what I was just School thinking. School being in session is not a factor anymore. It used to be if Milwaukee was in town for a Monday to Wednesday series and school was in session, there might be 15,000 people out there. They might announce 20. There might be 15, 12 in the a, in a seats, depending on the weather. You know, now it's like they sell out for uh, even for the Marlins in town. They're going to get crowds of depending on what the promos are or whatever, they're going to get crowds of 35 to, to uh, 30 to 35,000 in the middle of the week when school's in session. So that's not a factor anymore. And um, I, I would think that the Braves would want to open at home, you know, at least some of the time, because like this week, for instance, we were in Philly and Chicago, the weather in Atlanta was in the sixties, getting up to 80, two days ago yeah. it was 80 here when it was, when they played in the forties and they had the wintry mix and the, in, uh, later at night in uh, Chicago. So anyway, that's my long spiel about that. But for people who keep asking me, why don't the Braves ever open at home? That's why they didn't for all those years. Now, I don't know if they'll acknowledge that or not, but I mean, come on, if they, if they had, if there hadn't been a reason, Braves officials are going to come out and, and complain yeah, about why that. Why don't we get more opening? Right. Days. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So that's the reason. And, uh, and the logic it was sound logic for a long time, but it's not anymore. Because the Braves sold out like 54 of their 81 home games last year. They're like third in the league in attendance. And the only teams they had them were like the Cardinals, which is another baseball crazy city. Or oh, sold the tickets before everybody realized they were going to suck. And the Dodgers, who have a ballpark that seats 55,000 yeah. in a metro area that's twice the size of Atlantis. Yeah. So there you go. Um, and a great team right now, just like the Braves. So anyway, um, it was. I thought it was a great opening trip for the Braves. They went three and two. Uh, they didn't get to play that third game in Philly. It would have been Strider starting. They would have won that game. I'm almost certain, and they would have won both series on the road trip. And that's all you ever want on the trip. Yeah. If you can win a three game series, that's good. And almost and, swept Philly. And especially against a team as good as the Phillies, because the Braves yeah. had had been swept in each of the previous two opening series in Philly when they opened the season. They had gone zero and six. So yeah, they almost swept them. That was a one-run loss in the one in the last game, and I thought the pitching was great. Freed was the only starter who did not have a good start, and yeah. you're not worried about him. But the bullpen was great. Had a couple of bad innings. Bummer was the only guy that re didn't really shine among the relievers, and uh, and even he was throwing well. I thought he looked good. Yeah, but um, the the big development I guess coming out of Chicago would have been. A, Charlie Morton is still not showing age. He's 40 years old. And as Devon, as Darno said, I know the whole league's taking notice. There's a guy still throwing 96, 97 with a banger of a curve, and he's 40. But the big one was Ronaldo Lopez. Yeah. His first start in three years, and he's the only brave starter that went six innings in his first start this year. He went six innings, and they were sharp, man. He went toe for toe that for that big lefty crochet. That kid's a stud for the White Sox. It's like B Billy Wagner leg kick. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I could, I, I've seen him pitch before, but I've never gotten to actually watch him, you know, work. I've seen his highlights and, and clips of him, but I've never watched him. What? Yeah. Full yeah white nasty. Game. And man, that is like, it, I don't, those are the guys that I, I don't know how they ever fail. You know, I watch yeah. them and I'm like, you have that stuff. You should put up to ground numbers every year. Yeah. That's only his second major league start, and he looked like a ace to me. Yeah. So they got the, the White Sox got some players, man. I mean, they hadn't won a game until they won that one against the Braves, but they lost three one run games to the Tigers, who haven't lost yet. And um, and they played the Braves without Eloy Jimenez. So they got Eloy Jimenez on top of Luis Robert, Mancata, yeah. 
I mean, they got they got some studs, man. They just don't have somebody, a leader type guy. They don't have a yeah. good vibe, it doesn't feel like. But they got some pitching. Um that, that, that and that how about bringing in Kopech to close? That dude was throwing gas. Yeah, I don't know if he knew where the ball was going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I think you could see the game and, I, you know, you got to let him off the hook. This is his first time trying to do this and kind of getting just thrown into the role. But and it was cold. You you could see him getting a little. The moment was was amping him up a little too much. You know, I mean, yeah. he would get ahead of a hitter and then miss up fastball up fastball up. And I'm watching his fastball like, dude, you just have to get it in the zone. Yeah, that thing is taking off and they almost got him. You know, I mean, they made him work, but loaded the bases against him. Huh? I'm sure it was tempting just to make him, you know, go up there and not swing for a few pitches, but Darno popped up. Games. When I watch those games and a guy's throwing like that, I'm like, you might have better odds just not taking a bat because yeah. the only thing you can do with a guy making the ball move like that is do him a favor. It's yeah. 99. It looks like it's jumping and he's having a hard time finding the zone. You'd never tell hitters to do this, but being a pitcher and experiencing not having control and being a little too amped up for a moment. I'd tell yeah. my guys to take two strikes. See if he can throw two strikes before you even think about swinging the bat. Uh, so Darno popped up to end that when they had loaded the bases, had a couple of walks. Uh, but, yeah, good series for the Braves. Mar uh, Marcelo Zuna hit, was the only offense in that series, in that uh, game for the Braves. They lost, what, 3-2, and he hit two, two, home two uh, solo homers. In the cold, man. I don't know how he did it because – Nobody else was getting it up like that, but um, he did. Uh, he stroked those two balls, but uh, yeah. I, I thought uh, I thought for the whole trip, I thought they played pretty good baseball for the first week of the season. Good defense. Um, they got to be happy with that left field platoon defensively on top of getting the, all the hits that they got from Duvall and uh, Kelnick. And Kelnick is just – that guy really impressed me. I mean, yeah. we talked about how he looks like a ball player. But I think simplifying his swing – because I, I was told by people in Seattle said he's been working on uh, tweaking his swing for three years, making all kinds of adjustments. And Seitz said – he's had so many guys tell him, do this, do that. And, you know, guys like that when they're young, they're studs, and they and they get frustrated. And some guys are open to listening to everybody. And you got so many guys saying so many things – Guys you trust or guys who've had success, and 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 I think it can get confusing for you. And yeah. Seitz said they worked. He said he waited a few weeks, talked to him, met with him a lot, and then they said they got a lot of the hand movement out. And then the, and then the kid himself went up to Seitz and said, "I'm so tired of trying to time myself with this leg kick. I'm just getting rid of it. So it's not completely gone, but it's a small one now. So it's just so much simpler at the plate." And he doesn't need to do all that crap to hit the ball with power. This guy's no, got power. Big kid, yeah. So no, he's you have ripped. To, that's probably the hardest thing for, for young players or anybody in general to recognize is you have the strength and the power to succeed without like trying to do extra stuff to generate it. You know, there's certain guys like Bautista came up with that leg kick, and I don't know if it was a timing thing or it just got him way more momentum yeah. into his swing. But Kelnick's a strong – I mean, if you look at him, he's jacked. Yeah. And, it's interesting because a lot of guys fall into this trap and coaches fall into it too. Maybe a guy's mental space isn't right, but he has a, a rough, you know, two or three games. Let's give him something to work on with his swing. And the last thing you ever want to be do doing is thinking about mechanics in a game. Yeah, like You have to get to the point where when the game starts, now I'm competing and playing baseball. If you ever get lost in your mechanics or I grounded out, what did I do wrong with my swing? It's like, you didn't do anything wrong. You just missed the ball. It happens. It's baseball. Same thing with pitchers. You know, you have a bad day. It's like, maybe I don't need to go tweak and change anything. But guys that fall into that trap, you better run into the right coach to get out of it because they'll always be making adjustments. And God, it's it's an ugly place to be. I went there toward the end of my career. And there was, I mean, I had new mechanics. I, I had a point where I was throwing wiffle balls to my wife in a hallway trying to find my arm slot at 2 a.m. That's how... Wow ugly it got trying to fix this thing and and find things and what i really need to do is just back off and play baseball but you can get obsessed with fixing yourself when there might not even be anything wrong and that, i mean if you look at his career it makes sense that a lot of that's been going on and and this might be the perfect spot for him to fall into you know with a, a pitch a hitting coach that just says hey let's just simplify it and play baseball 
Yeah, Sight said he looked at his numbers in a in a minors where he was just a monster. Yeah. And he said, and then he looked at video from him then and he goes, Why would you change anything when you were yeah. that guy? Why would you change anything? And in the last few years, because when he came up the majors, he was still like that. He was still hit, it was still a simple approach. And he said in the last couple of years, when he struggled, he started trying to do all these different things and yeah. got away from it. And Sites kind of tried to, he said, I waited a couple of weeks. We met a bunch of times and uh, got him to trust him. Dusty's intruding on our podcast. And he, uh, and, and and ultimately the kid kind of realized, yeah, like I'm trying so much with his leg kick and all that. I'm just going to set to hit for power and I'm just going to go out and try to get base hits because he wasn't getting any hits in spring training. Yep. All of a sudden he was getting hits in that last week and he got a double. Or he got a triple and a home run. He, and Lasite said when he hit a home run on the last day of camp, is that I knew. Now he's getting some success. He's seeing what he can yep. do. His confidence is going to be back. And then he goes out in Philly. He had a three-hit game with two RBI singles and a walk in the same game. So, yeah, this uh, that's that's a big development for the Braves. I mean, who knows? It's just a week, but he really looks good and sound looks at good the plate. To me. I mean, it just looks so clean and simple. Good bat path. And I think a, another trap that that can happen to a lot of guys, like if you look at Adrian Beltre's career, it's a Hall of Famer, but he struggled in Seattle. You know, is, what can happen is you hit some balls well, and the ball just doesn't fly in Seattle. Yeah. So now it's like, yeah. okay, I, I need more power. I got to do this. I got to change it. And I think a lot of hitters go to, you know, certain parks where, I mean, Dodger Stadium is a good one too, but you go to certain parks where the ball doesn't fly and it's like, oh, I need to generate more power. And it's kind of like, you just have to accept the park you're playing in and stay with what's been working, get some more home runs on the road. But it's really easy to lose that confidence in your power when you think you got one and it winds up at the track. We talked about guys. Uh, oh, first, let me, let me read this real quick. One of the best ways to support the podcast is to buy some of the merch we've got loaded uh, with options on our site. And we got hoodies, slides, T-shirts, mugs. Got all kinds of stuff. And you can visit 755forever.com, 755forever.com, and click on store to check all that stuff out. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, baseball shirts with the sleeves and all that. Um, we talked about some of the pitches that a few guys added in spring training. And the big ones being Strider. Strider throwing a curveball. And so far, we and he threw a bunch of them in that Philly game. But the other one that we saw unveiled and... Lopez has thrown a curveball in the past, but as a reliever the last few years, he didn't need it. And he was throwing fastball. He was throwing four seam, sinker, and slider as a reliever, which about total of about 10 miles an hour differential with nothing big in there. Now he goes, throws a curveball in this game the other night against the White Sox, and he threw a bunch of good ones. <laughs> yeah, I mean, almost every strikeout was on it, it looks like. Yeah, you would have never thought that uh, that he hadn't thrown it for a while because he, I mean, it came back to him quickly. And man, you would have never. This guy he hadn't he hadn't started in three years, and he looked outstanding. Everybody was like, "Oh man, I can't believe the Braves could use him as a starter. He's so much better in the bullpen." Blah blah blah. Well, it turns out I think they might have known what they're doing because that pen is loaded, and right now he's a better fit for the rotation. Him. Jim, Bow Jim Bowden rated the uh, rotations a couple of days ago. And I've told, I've said all along, when we've discussed this. I said, if those guys are healthy, I don't see anybody's got a rotation as deep as the Braves with yeah. Charlie Morton as your number four and Lopez as your number five. Well, one time through the rotation, I think it's evident now Jim Bowden rated the rotations a couple of days ago and he had the Braves number one yeah. in the majors. Yeah. I mean, there might've been some ifs, you know, is, is Charlie going to, Still right. have it is still going to stay healthy, but then it, it, you go on the other side of that. It's like, yeah, but if if Charlie still has it and Sale stays right. healthy, who's go? I mean, you you get to a four or five, and those are the guys you're facing. Versus a lot of teams have their four and five or guys they called up or they're hoping for the best with. Uh, it's a it's a deep rotation. Like the White Sox were going to do a bullpen game for their fifth already. Yeah, you know because they got a couple of guys out. Yeah, and they yeah. got Soroka. You know, so they're number two. I mean, I mean that's the White Sox, of course, but even like the Dodgers got some questions at the back end because of injuries. But yeah, there were questions for sure. There were questions at three of the five spots, three, four, and five. Yeah, Sales never held. He's never stayed healthy in recent years. He only had twenty starts last year for him was like making thirty-five starts. You know, uh, 
Charlie's 40 years old. At some point, he's going to pitch. You know, he's going to be a decline. Okay, and Lopez Michael, hadn't please. and Lop, Lopez hadn't done much as a starter and hadn't started yeah. for three years. So, yeah, those were all question marks. But they've all been answered so far. It's one time through. It's way too early. But if they pitch like that, this team's really, literally got a chance to win every night if you get a start from those guys and they stay healthy. And that bullpen that you got, you don't need to score six runs like you did a lot of times last year. But you still got the capability of scoring six runs most nights too. You're still going to do it. Yeah, I mean, it, when you watch this Against team, the average pitching, they're going to six, six, seven runs. Easy. When it, I mean, it, it's just it feels exactly like last year. The the first couple series, you know, maybe get down and then all of a sudden they put up five. The, the offense was just it 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 might be better. I mean, with Kelnick in the nine hole, Harris was in the nine hole most of last year, so yeah. that was solid. But um. With with him in left field, him and Duvall, that's better than what you had in left field for most of the yeah. with Rosario there. I mean, Rosario, yeah. yeah, if he plays like he did against the Dodgers in the postseason, yeah. that's one thing. But yeah. he wasn't like that last year. So, yeah, with Kelnick and Duvall in left field, that is a better offense because everybody else is the same. Yeah, and nobody had a year last year for me when I watch it. Nobody had a year that I didn't think they could repeat. Like, you watch Acuna, dude, like, that's just who he is. You know, maybe it's right. not 40-40, but he's going to be in that ballpark. Right. It feels like every season. You can't really name anybody that overperformed their ability last year. Uh, that's another thing, too, is they've done what they've done so far without much from Acuna. He's had a few singles, a double, um, stole a base, but nothing like last year. And I think you got to realize he missed a lot of spring training after that. They were real careful with him after, you know, yeah. the knee. So – He's just kind of – it's going to take him a week or two to get sharp. And I say that, he'll go out tomorrow and have two home runs and nobody's going to be surprised. But At home, let's give him – He's you going know, deep this series. <laughs> so far, he hasn't been the dynamo that he normally is. But, I mean, he, he didn't play much at all at spring training until the end. So, it's well – Five games. I wouldn't worry about him until we're – No, I'm not worried about him at all. Yeah. I'm just saying they've done what they've done without him doing much at all. So, you know, um, out of the gate – RC has looked great. That's really encouraging because he kind of tailed off in the second half last year after making the All Star team. He's looked great so far. A lot of doubles. Uh, Matt Olson after having a bad springs looked real good so far. Duvall after <laughs> Duvall played two games in Grapefruit League at the end. Started he signed a week before camp was over. Riding a bike or two weeks before camp was over and yeah. played some minor league games. Got like five to seven abs a game. Played two Grapefruit League games at the end and look at him. He's look good. So yeah. this is going to be a uh, – the the result of the rain out is for fans who have tickets to the opening series, you're going to like this because Strider now, you get to see Strider is going to start the home opener after also starting the, the opening day. So you get Strider in the home opener, Max Free game two of the series, and Chris Sale. So you also get to see Chris Sale, whom you wouldn't have been able to uh, see if that thing had not rained out. So – that's that's a that that's a nice little pitching. The the Diamondbacks had got to uh, wish the Braves had not been rained out, probably. So not that it gets easy with Charlie, you know, at four like we've talked about, but um, should be a great opening series. The weather looks good. Got some rain coming in next week, but this weekend should be good. A little cool at night, but uh, nothing like on the road. I mean, we're up, we're like sixty and windy today, but um, not as warm as it has been the last few days here. But it's nice. It's sunny. Pollen is in full force. Um, so you'd be taking the Clarendon D if you're so inclined, but yeah, it was a it was a good trip. It was a good opening trip for the Braves. I mean, those were there were terrible conditions in Chicago as far as the cold and the wind, and they didn't really show it. I mean, Braves acted like they were the home team, you know. Yeah, I think that second game, I I was like, I don't even know if I want to give these pitchers too much credit, but they both right. looked amazing. But with that weather, yeah, it's hard to it's hard to get super excited because. It sucks to pitch in that weather, trying to stay loose and everything. But yeah. as a hitter, getting jammed in those situations, staying loose, it's it's tough. I couldn't believe Ozuna. It looked like on one of them, it looked like he got tied up a little bit and he still hit it out. It's funny because he after the after the game, he was talking about uh, Kopech. He said he's nastier out of the pen than he was starting. And we asked him about Crochet, and he said he good, he good, he's good, but. He goes, it's cold. Let's wait till just wait till the warmer weather and see how he looks. So I'm like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. He wasn't he wasn't ready to throw roses at him just yet. Yeah. Snit did. Snit said that's about as good as you're gonna see over the course of the year. 
I mean, he was impressive. Crochet is impressive. That's, yeah, I mean. And Kopech in the pen. As long as he throws strikes. But he can he can air it out, man. That dude is nasty. I'd say he just has to get comfortable, you know, and it'll probably it'll probably take a few outings to calm down in those situations. Like, I've been a reliever my whole career. and The A's put me in the closer role because our, our – Closer was hurt for like five yeah. or 10 days. And it was still kind of a different beast, you know, when it's sure. It, I actually blew a save in Chicago. Tyler Flowers took me deep. And Kopech's coming in in a safe situation against one of, if not the best team in baseball with the best line, deepest lineup. So yeah, in the cold, I yeah. can't grip the ball, get much movement on it. So yeah, it's hard to judge anything in that weather. I mean, it was, I don't know how cold it looked on TV, but it was cold there. And that wind made it so much colder. Well, when you see the Latin dudes in the full ski seats, yeah. Yeah. you know, you know it's cold. It's yeah. I think it's a lot harder for them because yeah. sure. they don't ever play in that growing up. They don't grow up in that at all, like people do from three fourths of the of the US. Yeah. They don't know? spend their off seasons in it. They don't see that weather. And a lot of them play for the uh, brief time some of them spend in the minor leagues, they might not ever see it in the minor leagues either. If you're in a Southern yeah. league, a league down yeah. here. So yeah, um, yeah that's got to be odd, man. It's just so different. The feel of the bat and all that in that weather. That's just so different. I remember Evan Gaddis even went without batting gloves in that weather. We were out in Colorado when a game and in in, when they played it, had to play a double header where it snowed out the day before and they had to play a doubleheader and the temperature never got to 32 all day. Was that in Colorado? Yeah. And that Julio was the said, worst. Julio pitched a great game in that weather, but Gaddis played without his batting gloves still in that weather and hit a bomb. Yeah, that's insane. I, polar bear. For, that, for that game, I was outside for probably a total of seven minutes. They let me stay in the clubhouse, and uh, when the like fifth, sixth inning, I knew I was throwing the eighth. When the fifth, sixth inning rolled around, I started riding the bike and getting a sweat going. Yeah. Um, they told me, "Hey, you got next inning." I jumped down in the cart, walked out, walked out the back way into that bullpen. They handed me a ball, and I started chucking. And so I'd been outside for no time at all. I was perfectly warm, and I was still miserable and throwing about eighty-seven in that game. It was so cold. Um. Talking about that that first trip, how good the offense has been. Five games, the Braves are hitting 368 and got a 429 OBP. That's good to see. They've only got they've only had five. That's not that's that can't be accurate, right? Let's see. Five now. I'm looking at strikeouts. Is that possible? The Braves have only struck out five times? No. No. No, that's no. no what's Wheeler. his name? Had more. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, what's his name? Wheeler had more than that in one game. What am I looking at? Oh, no, yeah, I'm looking at left field splits. Yeah, because I was doing a story and I was writing about uh, killing it. Yeah, Braves left fielders. Braves left fielders. Hitting 368 with a 429 OBP and only have five strikeouts between the two of them in five games. And Duvall can strike out some, you know. Kelenic has struck out a ton in the past. Yeah. Kelenic's got as many walks as strikeouts in five games, and that's huge. He's got two apiece, and that's huge because he and Seitz were talking about the biggest thing in simplifying and getting rid of the leg kick, the biggest thing See for him, seeing the ball. Yeah. And and he and he said, I said, does it feel simpler now? That you're swinging. He goes, Yeah, I'm seeing the ball better than ever. So it must be simple when I'm when when I'm got the leg kick going, all that. He goes, I feel like with with get rid of all a lot of the hand movement and the leg kick. He said, I'm seeing the ball better than ever. So and it shows up. His strikeout rate now is at a career low. His walk rate's at a career high. His whiff rate's at a career low. But he's swinging at more over fifty percent of the pitches so so far, and missing fewer than ever percentage wise. So again, this is only five games, and he started three of them. But that's that's a good; those are good signs against some really good pitchers like yeah, Wheeler. I can't believe he's walking in front of Acuna. You know, I mean, I I thought that nine hole would be huge because he'd get a lot to hit, but he's still... well. It's only two. It's only two walks, yeah. but he's only struck out two times. Yeah. So uh, his only thing he's done wrong so far was get caught stealing in front of, yeah. front of Acuna on opening day. And, and and Snit told him, when you're at first base with Acuna, you're in scoring position. Yep. And he said, I realized that afterwards. So, um, 
Snit said, it's my fault. I should have given him a stop sign. And Snit didn't. You know, he just assumed that he would do the right thing there or whatever. But he said, next time I will. But he did something similar in the White Sox game the other night. It turned out great yeah. because yeah. it was a full count. It was a borderline strike. It was right on the black. And it was called a ball. The guy couldn't frame it because he's yeah. worried about kept throwing Kelnick out. He's, yeah. he's, he's popping up. And if he'd have framed it, it's probably a strike because it's on the yeah. black. But I told Snit that I go, I said, uh, said a good point. I said, Kelvin probably saved, might have saved a strike out there by going because the guy couldn't, uh, the guy couldn't yeah. frame it. And Snit said, yeah. yeah, but if he'd have called a strike, it almost was a strike about, the, it was almost a double play. Yeah. yeah that's Yeah, that was too. kind of a lucky break that the ump missed right. that call. Right. Snit, if he'd have got thrown out again, Snit would have been pissed because he, you know, he said, the first time was my fault. So anyway, uh, <laughs> He went again. I'm sure he was going. That because wasn't it a was hit three and run. Two. I think maybe. He, well, he was going on three two. Yeah. You know, so it's maybe he thinks it's a little different. Yeah. But if he got thrown out again, Snit would have said, "Okay, that's it. You're not running anymore when Acuna's hit." <laughs> well, I guess so. If if that's the logic, if you think about it, then it's like this is his last pitch. So something's happening, or it's not there right. anyway. You're not taking the bat out of his hand right. in that situation. Exactly. But still, yeah. Yeah. So, but um. Um, Matzik again, he, he he makes another appearance in the uh White Sox series. He struck out three of the four guys he faced. I mean, you talk about encouraging coming back from yeah. TJ. No, he's not throwing quite as hard as he did before, but I mean, you came back from TJ. When I'm told this is totally normal, yeah. it takes a while to get all that velo back. Yeah. In the meantime, he's throwing with the same swagger, confidence he ever has, aggressive, great command, he's getting good movement. I mean, getting results. I, I don't have the metrics on it, but I bet you he gets either great extension or a really high spin rate because guys just miss his fastball. And that's the beauty of having, you know, a really, really good fastball, really good life to it and extension is even when you're down a tick or two, it's still got that that ride to it that hitters swing and miss. And if you watch him, yeah, maybe it's 94, 95 instead of seven or eight, but the swings are the same. And when you have that, that doesn't slump. The extension doesn't slump. Dylan Lee, real good appearance in, in Chicago. That was good. So somebody said the other day was complaining. You know, everybody looks for something. To, some some people look for something to complain about regardless. So they start out the season with four lefties and four right-handers. And the other day against the Phillies, uh, uh, it was a bummer. Gave up, gave up like four straight singles after the near double play that would yeah. have ended the inning. And somebody complained – that the Braves don't have a right-hander other than Chavez, who had gone three innings, and the closer and the two right-handers they have. They got Pierce Johnson and Joe Jimenez. I'm going, man, you talk about picking nits, dude, to say they don't have a right, right-hander just because they didn't have one to bring in right there. And for one thing, their lefties aren't lefty specialists in the traditional no, sense at all. They're full-inning guys. Yeah, they're not specialists. Mentor, Matzik. Bummer. I mean, these are and Dylan Lee. Okay, yeah, you want them to face a lefty, but they're not just they can they've got righties out. Look at their numbers. Luther um, and Matzik do not count for me. They're just good relievers. You know, right. I mean, if you had if you had me and George Sherrill down there and there's these drastic right. splits, right? We need a righty. We need Moylan or somebody to level that out. But Minter the splits, whatever, you know, I mean, they're, they're not going to be drastic. He's got that angle. And then Matzik, he's got the right on his fastball. So these aren't your typical lefties. I would count maybe Dylan Lee and, and Bummer as guys that you might want to shade toward lefties more, but they can still get righties out too. It's not like there's yeah. guys, righties hit 385 off in the pen. And as many left-handed stud hitters as you've got in this division and in baseball in general, you, I yeah. mean, to, it's such a luxury to be able to have four lefties. I mean, you don't want to, I mean, you don't want to give up one of those lefties to bring up a right-hander, right? I said if the Braves wanted to do that, if they've got a run of teams coming up or whatever, they feel like that would help, they would do that. It's not yeah. like they're handcuffs. they got plenty of righties down there, and they could option Dylan Lee. Yeah. So there's a reason they haven't done it. They know how to com uh, the composition of a bullpen a lot better than we do. Yeah. So that was stupid, I thought. Pierce um, Johnson's breaking ball. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it was on another level or what was going – if it was a Nasty. good camera angle or what. But that thing just that 
that pitch bites so hard. He must have, I mean, again, really high spin rate on that thing. That thing just dives, doesn't it? It takes off. It just takes a hard left. That was like one of the first thing they did after the postseason ended last year was re-sign him and Joe Jimenez. They wanted those two hard throwing setup guys. And that's a great move. I mean, those two guys are both nasty. Joe Jimenez, once he got over the back thing, you know, he had back surgery after the 2022 season. The Braves got him. It took him a while to get it going. And the, and the Braves trainers told Snit, it's going to be a while before he gets back to 100%. But once he did, he was nasty. Yeah. So – I just really like this pen, and they got depth down there at AAA. They can bring guys up. Also, they brought back Jackson Stevens. I'm not sure what there had to be a procedural reason why he did what he did, but they had outrighted him, and he opted for free agency. And even Snit was like, "I don't know why he did that. I mean, we're he's going to pitch for us. We're going. We know who he is. We love him. He's going to be back up here for us. I don't know why he won't want to go somewhere else where they don't know him." Sure enough, a few days after he said that, he re-signed with the Braves. And he's a triple A. So I'm not sure if he just wanted to see what was out there. Maybe yeah. he thought a major league team could use him, but he came back quick. He was back within a week. So the Braves I mean, got not, him. Why not check? You know, I mean, yeah, maybe there's somebody who wants to fill out their pen. Um, yeah. And, and you get a major even. league deal. Yeah. So he came back to the Braves and Alex and we've talked about this. This guy is as good at not getting caught with his pants down, making sure he has depth at the, at the important positions than anybody. So, what happens? Sean Murphy gets hurt. We don't know how long he'll be out. It's a grade one. That's the best news you can have for an oblique strain. They're going to be linger. careful. They don't want yeah. it to linger. They're going to be careful with him. So they've got Trump up here, and he's already caught a couple of games. So he's going to catch. It's probably going to be like a 3-2 split with Darno getting yeah. most of those. But all of a sudden, you don't have depth at AAA. So what does Alex do? He goes out and signs Sandy Leon, who used mm. to be a stud. But he's yeah. now a veteran guy. Just the kind of guy you want at AAA, more depth. And just, I, I think that's just what makes him such a good GM. He's not just now turning all his attention to the major league team. He's keeping an eye on the entire organization. And he's not going to get caught like they did a few years ago when they had to sign every guy, every journeyman catcher that was over the age of 35, I think, caught for the Braves that year. It worked out, but they had to scramble. You know, they 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 tried like three different guys caught for them that year that year. I remember uh Bruce Mano bitching about that. Uh Braves exec or you know, I can't remember. I think he was assistant GM at the time. Um, yeah, at the time. I remember him just saying, you know, you're always trying to fill that backup catcher role. And there's just this carousel of <laughs> Gerald yeah. Lairds and guys that you that you know, it's like the same guy, and there's like 15 of them, and you just pick one every offseason and hope they have a good year. And the Braves don't do that, obviously. No. They haven't done that since Sal Fasano got here. Yeah. I mean, they've had the best one-two combination over that period. It's varied. There's been different guys. But nobody's had as much catching as the Braves have had over that period. Solid catching. They just don't send a guy out there any night that the pitchers don't have complete trust in. Yeah. They, they just put so much value, priority in doing that. Is that relationship between the catchers and the, and the pitchers? They prioritize it above anything. And a lot of teams would have just sat on Darno, you know, as their guy, and and not gone out and got Murphy. But Darno is getting a little older, um, and that yeah. combo of two catchers that call a good game and can hit, yeah, never find that. Yeah, they had Contreras, and he has blossomed in Milwaukee. So yeah. I mean, it couldn't have gone wrong keeping him. But at the time. You know, he was more of a DH. He was just still learning catching. And as it turned out, you know, he's – but they wanted another guy experience and and Murphy and a uh, uh, guy in the prime of his career and a guy they knew they, they thought they could re-sign to a long deal. And yeah. it worked. Cannon. Yeah. So um, what was the other thing I was going to say? What impressed me about the trip? Yeah. Uh, I had something in mind, but anyway, so yeah, good trip. Uh, you know, other than, uh, other than Sean Murphy getting hurt, that was really the only negative that we had the whole trip. And the fact that that's grade one and not, and not a lot worse is pretty big. I mean, if that had been worse, that's a Trump, Trump's a good backup. He's a good backup catcher. He's a guy that yeah. if he was out of options, he'd be somewhere. Yeah. Somewhere that's got a frontline catcher, like a real Muto. He, he'd be a, he could be a good backup for a team that, for a catcher that plays four out of five. And um, and he will be once he runs out of options. The Braves probably won't be able to keep him. 
So, but he's he's solid here, and he sits in. The good thing they do is they keep those they keep him in camp till the very end. So he sits in on those meetings every day, yeah. every day with Murphy, Darno, Safasano. You know, so he's learned, he's heard everything with the pitchers. He's, he's he's heard everything they've done. He's done all the same drills they've done. So he knows exactly what they do. Does the one knee catching like everybody in the organization does now? They do the one knee catching from the top, from the bottom up now. And Sal worked that in when he first got here. Tyler Flowers is the guy that brought that got Sal Fasano that converted him to one knee catching. Sal kind of yeah. was a skeptic at first, and Tyler showed him why it makes sense. So now they are one knee catching almost 100% of the time, and they've got guys to teach it in the lower levels too. So at spring training, that's all they do. Now they're doing it at all the way through so they don't have to get a guy up and, and and you know, the pitchers get used to a guy catching differently. So I think it saves your legs. You know, I mean, it's – That's it's the big tough. thing. It's tough watching a game and seeing a, a catcher not be able to get to a, a a pitch that maybe they could, you know, in a big situation. I've always thought maybe do it 85% of the time, but when the game's on the line, you can't let a pass ball happen. And maybe guys do. I haven't paid that close of attention, but let's, let's do it, you know, the – the old school way in those moments. But I think it definitely saves guys knees, not, not squatting the whole game. That's the biggest thing is like Murphy. They taught him to do it. He wasn't doing it at all in Oakland. And after he learned to do it, he said, yeah, you don't get tired. And especially in, in Atlanta in the heat. Yeah. And Darno said, if I wasn't doing it, I'd probably be done now. He's 35. And they said, it's just a huge difference. Your legs don't get tired when you're on yeah. one knee like that. And the other thing is I asked Sal about what you were talking about. He goes, people say that, that you might have trouble, you know, getting to certain balls and certain sides and all that. He goes, look at our numbers. Our numbers, we're great at blocking. And yep. he said, we can actually, you can do everything from one knee that you can do from, from, from crouching. He said, it's yep. just people don't know, don't believe that. Yeah. That's, that's why I haven't gotten too worked up over it because there's, there's some old school guys that are really pissed and it's almost like, you know, they cherry pick the one time it gets through and don't that, look at the rest of the game at the ones right. they blocked, but that shows up on people, the highlights. Yeah. They kind of have an agenda and pick it out and then like, look, one knee catching's trash or whatever. But I, I'm like, if, if, if all these major league catchers are doing it. Yeah. It's like, there's not idiots running the show. You know, right. they, they've done their work and, and it's definitely all right. And Snit was uh, – I asked Snit about this uh, late in camp, about the one thing. I was going to do a story. I haven't done it yet. But uh, Snit said, yeah, because initially he was opposed to it. He talked yeah. to us off the record. He's like, yeah, I don't like it. I don't know why so many of them are doing it. But he wasn't going to tell them what to do. But he says, I'm not comfortable with it. Snit's an old catcher himself. Yeah. And uh, now he goes, now he goes, no, I've come around on it because those guys have shown that they can catch like that. They stay, they stay uh, fresher. And he goes, I got no problem with it at all now. And he's, so he's really come around on that too, like he has a lot of things. Yeah. I've kind of, I mean, just taken the stance of, you know, I'll let the catchers tell me. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, they don't want to not do a good job. Right. Right. If Murphy didn't want to do it, you know, not doing it. He, he would tell Sally, he goes, look, I'm, I understand what you want to do, but I'm comfortable doing it like this. And they're not going to tell him, no, you've got to do it like this. Yeah. He's getting results and he's feeling how comfortable it is. That's a big factor. I mean, if you're not tired, that means you can catch oh. more. And, and in Atlanta Heat, that's a big deal, man. I got I got roped into coaching Little League, and I'm catching these kids' bullpens, and they obviously throw it, you know, everywhere. But I'll squat for one, and I'm grabbing a bucket. If they hit me in the shin, they hit me in the shin. But, <laughs> you know, I get, I get tired in 15 minutes. Imagine squatting for oh. – uh, nine innings for a whole summer, you know, not even, I'm not, you don't get, you get a couple of days off here and there, but three hours a day, back to back to back to back. I mean, I'm tired after 15 minutes. Imagine a catcher in his thirties, how many thousands of innings he's caught still trying to do that crouch. And you it's see amazing it guys like Carlton first Fist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Guys like Carlton Fist did it as long as they did. Yeah. It's amazing. Catching your 40 and big man like that. Amazing. Yachty. But, how many games did he catch? Oh my God. Yeah. And so many of those catch older catchers too used to wear those pads behind their knees. Yep. That just support when they get to the crouch. It, it's like in effect doing what going to one knee does. It takes that yep. pressure off your knees. So I don't think you see those at nearly as many as much now with guys doing one knee catching. Those guys don't wear them at all. The one knee catching guys. No. You don't need and, to. I mean, you just think about how all that compiles up. If if you're a young catcher that's going to be playing every day and you want to have any knees left in your 30s. Yeah. 
I remember Darren Dalton at the end, man. He had had ACL a couple times, I think. And yeah, in his thirties, he had to get he had to go through a hell to, to still catch. Yeah. So, all right. Well, big weekend series coming up. Home opener. There are going to be huge crowds, and then we're going to celebrate Hank Aaron's seven hundred fifty fifth home run. That's coming up on uh, on uh, Monday, right? The date you of that. Me. Or is that I don't even that? know what today is. Anyway, it's the fourth. Anyway, we're having a big, they're having a big celebration of that and guys in town coming 50th celebration of the home run. So that's a big deal. So it's a big homestand, a lot of stuff going on. So I hope to see you guys out there. Keep listening to the show, watching it, give us ratings and all that. Subscribe on YouTube if you haven't already. And that way you'll get alerts that we have another one up and all that kind of thing. So it makes it a lot easier. We appreciate it. All right. 750.